morning, everybody. Welcome to Bethel Today. My name is Matt Olson. And I'm JC Olson. Our family is part of the Bethel Fergus Falls campus. Our kids are Hadley and Henrik, and I enjoy teaching Sunday school this year. And I'm often found on Sunday mornings being an usher or a greeter, and I also serve as an elder here at Bethel. Two things coming up here at Bethel this coming week that we want to share with you. First, Bethel's annual meeting is next Sunday, February 11th at noon, one week from today, right after the 1030 worship service. This meeting is a celebration. Come to worship in the morning and stay for lunch, served with the meeting right afterwards. Lunch will be provided by our awesome Bethel Youth Group. It's a fundraiser for students going to the youth convention this summer. So next Sunday, please come. Let's gather together to reflect on what God has done and where he is leading. Second, also next Sunday night, you're invited to the second annual Super Bowl watch party here at Bethel. This event starts at 5.30 in the worship center. Bethel will provide the taco meal and you bring a salty or a sweet snack to share. No registration is needed. Just show up and watch the game on the big screens. There'll be other games and activities and prizes throughout the night, and we'll have a great time together. We'll see you next Sunday night for the game. And one last reminder, we will have a special worship service to begin the season of Lent on Ash Wednesday, February 14th. We'll enjoy a meal together, followed by communion and worship right at the dinner table. Our theme this year is love stories, pictures of passion from the cross. Attend with your family or bring a friend. Take time to worship during the week as we gather at six o'clock on February 14th. And as always, stop by the Connection Center today or go to the Bethel website or app for details about these or any other Bethel events. Church, we are so glad you're here. It's a great day we have been given, a day to gather, to give thanks back to God for his love toward us and to praise Jesus our Savior. So again, welcome to you and let's enjoy worshiping him together. Hey everyone, Pastor Dave Foss here. Thanks for connecting with us today at Bethel. It's my prayer that this message be something that God uses in your life in conjunction with you belonging to a local church. We believe that online messages can help fill the gap when worship in your local church just isn't possible on a given weekend. Maybe you're traveling, maybe you got some health stuff going on, whatever the reason, isn't it great that we can connect like this? It is, and we're happy to share this online resource with you to encourage you so you can meet back here with us at Bethel or wherever your faith family is gathering. So again, thanks for connecting with us today and hope to see you soon. Well, greetings to those of you joining us uh, this morning online. It's good to be with you. Um, I want to start uh, by, by calling out something that we learn early on in life. One of the things we, we learn early in life is this, that just because something tastes good doesn't mean it won't kill you if you eat it, right? Just because something tastes good doesn't mean it won't kill you. Uh, author and theologian Frederick Buechner uh, wrote about the Feast of Unforgiveness. Here's what he wrote. He said, to lick your wounds... To smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontations still to come, to savor the, uh, to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back, in many ways is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Hmm. Well, today we come uh, to the part of the Lord's Prayer where we are confronted with the uncomfortable relationship between our forgiving and our being forgiven. Uh, the uncomfortable relationship between our willingness to forgive and our desire to be forgiven. We find that uh, tension in Matthew chapter 6 today. I'm going to read verses uh, 9 through 15, so you can just listen uh, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 15. This is in a section on the Lord's Prayer, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. We read there this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is God's word for us. Would you pray with me? Um, Lord, thank you for your holy word. Uh, May it be holy to us today. May its authority stand over us. Uh, May its strength stand under us to support us. And may its light uh, shine in front of us to guide us on our way. And give us your aid now as we look at your scripture and to discover there the good things you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, uh, now before we get into the heart of the message today... Uh, I want to draw attention to something that may be, for some people, just a curiosity, and for other people, a distraction. Have you ever been a part of a group of people, maybe a broader group of people than just the people that meet in your church, where you pray the Lord's Prayer together, and they've said it differently than you do? Have you ever been a part of that? That's been your experience? Um, Here's what I want us to see today. Uh, In different churches and in different traditions, for example, some people say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Some people, like us here at Bethel, we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, Some in other traditions say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Right? Right? Okay. What's the deal with that? What's the deal with that? Okay, I want to offer some brief statements now in response to this. Uh, First this. The, The actual word here in verse 12 is the word debts. The the, the actual word is the word for debts. Uh, William Tyndale was the first to translate verse 12 in in English as trespasses in in 1526. So it's kind of a a Tyndale versus King James uh, type thing. Um, So the word is actually debts. But then when you get to verse 14 and 15, which expands on this idea of forgiveness in verse 12, in verse 14 and 15, the word there is the word for trespasses. Again, so verse 12, debts, verse 14 and 15, expanding on 12, uses trespasses. Over in Luke 11, you see the word sins. Uh, so, so what are we to think of this? It, it really sort of depends on the tradition that you are a part of. Uh, maybe the church that you're part of says the word debts, which has this idea of not paying back what you owe. Uh, maybe it's for, uh, trespasses, which has the idea of going where you don't belong, Or maybe your church tradition has the idea of forgive us our sins, which is the word hamartia, which means to miss the mark. Um, Picture, you know, like shooting an arrow and going wide, right, left, up or down. You you miss the thing. Uh, That is the word sins. That's the idea of sin. Question, which is right? Which one is right? Debts, trespasses, sins, which one should we use? Uh, Answer, um, the, the, the scripture uses these three words interchangeably, all of them to refer to the sins that we commit against God and against uh, one another. And so here's the conclusion that I come to and offer to you, that you may use any of them as you pray this prayer, that you may use any of them without undermining what Jesus invites us to pray. So if you're at a church where they use a different word, feel free to use that word. That's okay. All right. So. I thought it was important enough to touch on that. Now let's, let's get to it. Let's, let's, let's dive into this idea of forgiveness and unforgiveness. Let's see what uh, Jesus has to say. Uh, because here's what usually happens when you talk about forgiveness and unforgiveness. What usually happens is when the preacher starts to preach about unforgiveness, the people listening start to say, oh man, that's so good. I wish so-and-so were here to hear this. Like, I really, they, somebody else needs to hear that. You know, it's not, it's not me. It's never me that needs to hear this message. It's always somebody else uh, because we always think that forgiveness and unforgiveness is somebody else's problem. Somebody who struggles with unforgiveness is somebody else. It's never my problem, right? No, 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 not me. Not me. I'm allowed to be bitter. I'm allowed to be bitter. You're not, but I'm allowed to be bitter. 
I'm allowed to hold a grudge because of what happened to me. And pastor, if you knew, if you knew what happened to me, you would never expect me to forgive that either. That's what we say. And what we find is that we find ourselves sitting at the feast of unforgiveness. As Beekner says, in many ways it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. So, how do you deal with people who don't know that just because something tastes good doesn't mean that it won't kill you? Just because something doesn't, some, just because something tastes good, like, like unforgiveness tastes so good, doesn't mean it won't kill you. Well, how do you deal with people like that? Well, you tell them a story. You tell them a story. Uh, a story is kind of a, a sneaky way to get a message across to somebody who doesn't want to get the message. A, a story has the, the ability to t- sort of tunnel underneath the defenses of the listener so that even before they see the trap, they find themselves caught in it. They're caught in the trap of the story. I think that's why Jesus told so many stories. Um, Jesus, uh, Jesus would often say something like, once there was a, or the kingdom of heaven is like, and then would come a story. And pretty soon, uh, the listeners are going, yeah, 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 yeah. Man, man, I wish so-and-so were here to hear this. They could really use a story like this. And then right at the end of the story, the, 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 the trap sort of springs on them, and they find that the story was not only for them, but it was about them the whole time. Just so sneaky, so sneaky. And Jesus had the ability to use stories like that. In fact, uh, he has so many great stories. He has, he has so many awesome forgiveness stories. What I want to do is share with you two of Jesus' really awesome forgiveness stories. Uh, Here's the first. The first is found in Matthew chapter 18. And what we find there in Matthew chapter 18 is Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, who had heard what Jesus taught on prayer and how to pray, right? He he had heard this, who one day uh, asked a question that I think nobody else in the group had the guts to ask. And here's what he asked. He said in verse uh, 21 of Matthew 18, then it says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And, and Peter probably thought, you know, that's being pretty generous. I mean, like, if somebody sins against you once, all right, that, that's once. Like, but if you do it again, and then they do it again. It's like, oh, man, I don't, okay, I suppose I forgive them again. And three times, maybe, but ah, let's just go with seven. Seven seems super generous. And he probably thought that until Jesus replied. What Jesus said was this in verse 22. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. It's like, oh, man. Peter's like, oh, you're kidding me. I have to forgive that much. And then what Jesus does next, he sort of tunnels underneath the defenses of the question, and and he starts a story that goes like this. Verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Okay. Now, the story starts out with an almost laughably ridiculous and seemingly impossible situation. It starts out with a servant who owes something like $10 billion to the king. It's just this ridiculous amount, like 10,000 bags of gold. Like, just think $10 billion. Crazy. Like, in what universe could a servant repay somebody, anybody, let alone the king, uh, $10 billion, not, not in 100 lifetimes, like not in 100 lifetimes. He, he tells him, he drags him into the throne, says, pay up, and there's like just no chance. And so in the story that Jesus tells, uh, the king forgives the man his debts. He forgives him his debts. And the man no sooner leaves the king's presence than he sees a guy who owes him like $20, and, and this is what happens. Verse 28 of the text says this. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. It's like, like 20 bucks, right? He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. 
his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Okay, unbelievable, right? Like this is, this is crazy town. Like you gotta be kidding me. You were just forgiven $20 billion and you walk out and you throttle a guy for 20 bucks that he owes you? Really? Really? And you have him thrown into debtor's prison because of this. Oh man, what do we call this? This is the feast of unforgiveness. Like Beekner says, in many ways it, it, uh, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you're wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. And everybody, I think, listening to Jesus' story would have probably thought, man, what a loser this guy is. Who would ever do anything like that? Can you believe that guy? Oh, man, I can't believe him, right? And they, must, they might have even laughed. They might have even laughed because this was just so ridiculous. You're forgiven $20 billion, and you, like, choke a guy for 20 bucks that he owes you. Why don't you just give the guy a break? My goodness. And what Jesus is doing is he's setting the trap. The king in the story, the master heard about what this unmerciful servant did. He called him back into the throne room, and here's how the story continues. Verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger. His master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. That's the story. That's the story that Jesus told about forgiveness. And, and it, it's just so sneaky, right? Here's why it's so sneaky. Because Jesus gets them to lower their defenses, to laugh even, and then he springs the trap on them. Verse 35 this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Ah, oh. oh, right? I mean, honestly, I like the story until that part. How about you, fellow servants? It was such a good story until, it, until you made it about me, Jesus, and I don't like it nearly as much. What is Jesus doing here? He's illustrating the point about how for the forgiveness that we ask for relates to the forgiveness that we give. And I want you to get this. It's, it's not, the tone of Jesus here is not forgive or else. It's, it's not like that. It's, it's more like if you know and experience the grace of God, if you really know it, you won't withhold that grace and forgiveness from other people around you who need it. You just won't do that. There's just no way that you can know God's grace and mercy to know how much you have been forgiven and then hold something over somebody else. You need to go back to understanding how much God forgave you and let it set your heart free. In fact, this is, this is even what Jesus said earlier in the sermon, Matthew 5, verse 7. Remember when he said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Okay, so now I said there were two awesome forgiveness stories uh, that Jesus told that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, that was one of them in Matthew 18. The other one involves uh, not a servant, but a son. Jesus was being criticized by some religious people for how he was so, so gracious towards the sinners of the community uh, and these righteous people, these religious people just thought, man, they, they, have, they just do not deserve the grace that Jesus is showing them. They just don't deserve it. So Jesus uh, tells them a story, a story that starts like this. In Luke 15, there was a, a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. 
Um, does that sound like a story, uh, at the start of a story that you might know? Have you heard the story of the prodigal son? Maybe, maybe it's a story you've heard before. Race ahead with me in your mind to uh, how things progress in the story of the prodigal son. He ran away uh, from home with his father's money. He ran away with dad's money. And, and dad was, was crushed by it, but his brother was angry and he wasted, this prodigal son wasted no time uh, spending all he had, breaking all the rules he knew, disgracing his family name. He ends up penniless and friendless, uh, feeding pigs on a farm. That's what he's doing. And, and it was in that low point in the story that he starts to dream of home and remember how good he had it there. But he sinned against his father to such an extent that there was absolutely no way he could go back and ask to be forgiven. So he decides that he'll go back and ask if he can, well, if he can be a servant, if he can work for his dad. He decided to pay his debt with his sweat. So on his way home, he's rehearsing how he's going to apologize to his dad. Have you ever do anything like that? You're like, oh man, I got to, I got to get this right. He starts to rehearse an apology. Uh, What should I say? Where do I start? You know, I totally messed up. I don't want to mess this up now. So he goes. And what the son didn't know, what the son couldn't have known, is that the father had spent countless afternoons sort of scanning the horizon hoping that his son would come back home. And then one day, the father, looking on the horizon, sees dust kicked up in the path, and then he makes out the, 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 the kind of the shadow or the shape of his, the outline of his son coming to him, and he realizes that is his boy, and, and he just takes off. He just runs towards his son. And uh, before the son can choke out his rehearsed apology, the father just embraces him. He just swallows him up in his great big arms and pulls him in close. In spite of the stench of his body and the filthy rags that he wore, the father held him tight. And this is how the scripture puts it. Verse 21. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. <laughs> And the the party began, the feast began, the music was cranking, and the the welcome home party was just really thumping. I mean, it was going on. And the brother, the older brother, he might have first sort of smelled the feast, but then as he got closer, he could hear the, the music, and he could see the dancing, and he's wondering what in the world is going on. And so he, it says in verse 25, the older son who was in the field when he came near the house He heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. (laughs) Your brother's home. (sighs) He's like, oh man, not him. Not him, are you kidding me? He thought. The older brother didn't want anything to do with this feast. For his younger brother. I mean, like nothing. In fact, the father even goes out and pleads with him to come into the party. Please come in and celebrate with us. And as far as we know, as far as we know, he never did. He never did. Because he was attending another feast. The feast of unforgiveness. Again, as Beekner says, to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontations still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down 
is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. So like the first story, this second story of the prodigal son, it's just so sneaky, isn't it? Because you find that the story is not only for you, but it is about you. You're in the story. And the one who in the Lord's Prayer invites you to call him father pleads with you to come home, pleads with you to come in. His voice echoes down the long hallway of hope to wherever it is that you are. It reaches there. Come home. Come in. The feast of of forgiveness. The feast of forgiveness is where you find that your debts have been paid. Your father doesn't want his money back. All he's ever wanted is you back. He's wanted you back. The feast of forgiveness is where you find that your trespasses have been pardoned. Your father doesn't tell you to get out. He says that where you belong is right there with him. That's where you belong. Home with me. The feast of forgiveness is where you find that your sins have been forgiven. Your father doesn't delight in pointing out your failure. He delights in you. And so we can say with the Apostle John, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. I'm not worthy to be called your son, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And so we say, would you pray this with me now? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God's peace be with you.